All right, good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. My name is John Clements. I'm the technical lead for the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center, or HDIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DOD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, or DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DOD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. HDIAC supports those working in the homeland defense and security domains of DOD research and engineering. We do this by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. We provide research and analysis services and help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We provide a technical inquiry service in which government researchers, including contractors, can receive uh, four free hours of technical research. Uh, to learn more, go to hdiac.org and click on the technical inquiries icon. We hope you enjoyed this webinar and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DOD homeland defense and security research. Uh, before we begin, I just want to note a couple of administrative items. Uh, first, if you're dialed in by phone and would like a copy of the slides, they are posted to the HDIAC webinar announcement. You go to hdiac.org slash webinars and find today's webinar. When you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say uh, view webinar slides here, and you can download them from there. Second, all participants are muted, but you can chat with the presenters and moderators using the chat box to the left. However, if you would like to pose a question for the Q&A session at the end, please use the audience questions tool at the top center of your screen. It's the icon that looks like the chat bubble with a question mark uh, right next to an emoji. At the end of the presentation, I'll go over the Q&A, and for the benefit of those on the phone, I'll read the questions out loud to the presenter. Uh, the presenter would like me to pass along that basically uh, no question is out of bounds here. Um, feel free to ask any question that you feel um, uh, that you want that you want answered. Uh, also, as far as uh, classification goes, um, if you ask a question, he's uh, adept at, at being able to give you uh, an unclassified answer in this in this form. So there may you know this quickly can get into the classified realm, but please a ask your question anyway. And the presenter is well versed in um, what he can and cannot say over this this uh, uh, forum. Uh, if you have any technical issues during the presentation, have no fear. The full presentation will be available online and check back on the HDIAC website. Once the webinar is posted, the go to webinar icon uh, button will take you to the YouTube link. So now uh, I'd like to present uh, nuclear deterrence uh, presented by Robert Hill. Uh, Robert Hill is the business development lead and corporate subject matter expert for the nuclear deterrence domain with analytical services, also known as ANSWER. He's a retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel with over 28 years military and contractor experience in nuclear operations, arms control, strategic communications, and nuclear-related support, with assignments and positions in the Office of the Secretary of Defense twice, two unified combatant commands, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency three times, Headquarters Air Force Space Command, and multiple operational units. Mr. Hill is a proud member of the final class of Cold War Missileers, who holds a Master of Science degree in International Relations from Troy University and is a graduate of the Air War College and Joint Forces Staff College. And with that, uh, Mr. Hill, please take it away. Thank you. What a wonderful introduction. And I want to thank everyone for attending today in a subject that uh, is very near and dear to my heart uh, from not only the beginning of my professional career, but unfortunately has raised its uh, head again, uh, thanks to Mr. Putin of Russia. So I want to begin uh, first by saying that um, I'm going to present something that's a little different. If you do know or have some interest in, in nuclear deterrence, you will see a greater fidelity as I go through this, and uh, I look forward to Q&A during and, uh, and certainly after. So um, let's begin. Um, so a little more fidelity on based on what my background is. I'll call this my street cred slide. Um, I am the original 
uh, last generation of the Cold War missileers. I had five months on alert. And in fact, yesterday was the 31st anniversary of President H.W. Bush um, effectively ending the operational side of the Cold War uh, when he removed Miniman 2 missiles, bombers, and alerts off a of permanent alert status. And I was one of those that helped process those messages 31 years ago. So a little piece of history right there. Uh, throughout my career, uh, I have had various things, whether it was from nuclear command and control and communications, being a treaty inspector, and basically working at every different facet uh, of touching all the aspects of nuclear deterrence, nuclear governance, and that. And in addition to having worked a total of 14 years at strategic levels of policy and the strategic level of the war. So just a little bit about my background as I go into and begin to discuss what we're going to discuss. So I want to start with a backgrounder. Some of this you may be aware of, but I wanted to make sure everybody's kind of on the same sheet of music about why nuclear deterrence has become an issue again, and then what that actually represents. And I'm going to talk about it in a unique way to help you understand how difficult it is and how complex of a subject the idea of nuclear deterrence means. Well, to give you some key takeaways, and I'm going to give you an idea of where you can go for additional information for those interested in learning more. So let's begin. All right, on background. So I want to start about the nuclear weapon states. Now, as we've learned, unfortunately, I can't do the build, so work with me here. Um, the United States was the first to develop the atomic bomb. Many of you well uh, may understand the Manhattan Project and know about its background. To the right is the Trinity test, which was the first actual explosion of a nuclear weapon. We developed the atomic bomb in 1945 and followed suit with the hydrogen bomb in 1952. The difference between the two is a matter of two things. One, it is the materials used between uranium and plutonium and the type of explosion created between a fission weapon and a fusion weapon. I'll leave that for further study. Uh, but second and most importantly is the effect. The effect is in orders of magnitude between an explosion of approximately 12 to 15 kiloton range, which if you've ever seen those of Nagasaki or Hiroshima, you will see the damage versus into the hundreds of mega of kilotons into the megaton range uh, in terms of destructive power. Followed by the Soviet Union, United Kingdom, France, and China, which represent the UN Security Council permanent members. So by 1969, in the, in the United Nations and the treaty, that was determined to be who would be the permanent and unfortunately veto uh, members of that particular group. India followed uh, with an atomic bomb explosion in 74, though they did not develop an actual nuclear force structure until 1998, at the same time Pakistan did. Uh, and then North Korea, uh, their first atomic explosion that we believe was a legitimate one was 2006. Of course, that's based on intelligence data of that time. And then successfully testing a what we believe is a hydrogen level bomb in 2017. So those represent what are your stated nuclear weapon states. Now, the two below that, of course, Israel is an undeclared nuclear weapon state. And South Africa, which was a declared weapon state, who voluntarily gave up their nuclear weapons uh, at the end of apartheid and are now known as a former nuclear weapon state. Now, when it comes to Israel, the only understanding or proof, as you will, of their testing is known as the Vela incident. 
you can find significant information about that. But Vela was a satellite program that detected what is known as a double flash. And it was out by Prince Edward Island within the Indian Ocean. And in every single instance prior to seeing a double flash, they've all been nuclear tests. So although Israel never admitted to it, we believe it was a partnership with South Africa and being able to, do, uh, to actually test an actual weapon. So those represent the actual current nuclear weapon states. All right. So next, I want to talk about the strategic environment of the Cold War. Now, what we deem as the Cold War began really with the Truman Doctrine in March 12th, and that was a doctrine of what is known as containment, that we will contain communism wherever it spreads. So that officially began what is known as the Cold War. Well, there were two superpowers, especially following World War II and the demise of, of many of the great powers of the United States versus what it became the Soviet Union. We had two economic systems that were in clash of capitalism and the spread of communism, and really two predominant alliances in terms of where the war would start, and that is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization at the time and what was known as the Warsaw Pact, which developed a little bit later among those that were part of the Soviet Union. During that period, we had many proxy wars, the Korean conflict, the Congo crisis, Vietnam, and others, which were part of that containment policy, but were simply part of this idea of stopping the spread of communism. Why they were proxy wars is because we were supporting one side either actively or in terms of uh, supporting through arms or uh, advisory assistance, and the Soviets were doing the same on the other side. We had a few close calls, certainly during the Cold War, the first being the Suez crisis, which I'll give you an opportunity uh, and would certainly suggest uh, uh, looking at that period during the Eisenhower administration. The Cuban Missile Crisis, of course. The NORAD glitch, in which there was a software glitch which uh, presented basically the conditions that there was a massive attack against the United States, which was a nice baseline for the film, for those who might recall or have seen it, uh, the film War Games. And finally, Exercise Able Archer in 1983, Able Archer being the full-on nuclear-based exercise that was done in Europe. And at that time, and due to conditions that were happening uh, in Europe, there was a, a belief among many in the Soviet leadership that we were preparing to invade. So that was some of the close calls during that period. And then the end of the Cold War is December 25th, 6th, 7th, but basically the dissolution of the Soviet Union. So that kind of framed what would be considered the strategic environment of that day. So what is different of what we see now? Well, the strategic environment is really known now as the great power competition. And what it is is a reassurance instead of one but two powers who are either asserting or reasserting their influence, especially regionally, whether it's to, to establish regional hegemony among their particular points of view, government, or economic conditions, uh, or and some, in terms of China especially, are looking at a global ability to deny or diminish America's influence, whether it's in a crisis or our ability to operate freely in what is known as the as the global commons, such as sea, air, space, that kind of thing. It's kind of a remer an emergence of what we might see now as tripolar powers, whether it's the U.S. versus Russia, United States versus China, or if you understand some of the issues between them, Russia and China itself. There are many things that they have always disagreed on. But in addition to that, we are certainly seeing potential other flashpoints with nuclear powers, whether it's the United States versus North Korea and the Kim Jong-un regime, China versus India, 
who have had recent, not quite conventional conflicts, but problems at their, where they share their border and certainly a significant difference in, in both culture and, uh, and their political views. India and Pakistan, two legendary powers who have fought three conventional wars, who are both nuclear armed against each other. And the flashpoint, of course, is the Kashmir Peninsula, uh, in addition to the separatists who simply don't like either. So it's definitely a flashpoint. And of course, the final is Israel and Iran. Iran, of course, having uh, pursued a nuclear program and at some point most likely will break out uh, whenever they deem that necessary. But that is certainly some flashpoints in terms of nuclear powers. Today, we have varying political systems that are certainly clashing between the democratic, authoritarian, communist, and the alliances today are less focused. Certainly, we've seen with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, a reemergence, a reinvigoration of NATO, and more importantly, the expansion into two nations, Sweden and most especially Finland, that would have never been seen six to nine months ago. We also have the alliance that we have, the treaty with Japan, and their problematic relationship with China, especially when we're talking about disputed areas such as the Senkaku Islands chain, uh, which sits fairly close to Taiwan. Um, the new alliance with Australia, the United States, and the United Kingdom, which is a already members of the Five Eyes intelligence sharing community and longstanding partners, but a unique alliance based on the sale of, of nuclear capable fast attack submarines, which you may have seen on the news, but also an enhanced version of of uh, information sharing for security reasons and, and, and such. And then the final is six assurances, which for those who may or may not know, that, re that refers to the Taiwan Relations Act and our six assurances to them following uh, the abrogation of our actual treaty we used to have in defending uh, Taiwan abrogated uh, dur during the end of the Carter administration. So in terms of the way that we view alliances, it certainly is not a cut and dried issue. But more importantly, the gray zone has become where we've seen the greatest change of our strategic environment. And I said uh, best, is that we've always re, you know, generally viewed the world in terms of peace or war and that our adversaries do not think that way, which caused him really a revolution of military affairs in the way that we now perceive things when we look at military planning, uh, especially regionally. And that is the competition conflict spectrum, that there is no such thing necessarily as peace. We are either in a state of competition or we are in outright conflict. And today in the gray zone from cyber attacks, having spent three years supporting U.S. Cyber Command, I'm all too aware of that, from information operations campaign, items like energy manipulation, which you've certainly seen and probably been exposed to from Russia, um, not only now, but as far back as 2008, when uh, the first instance of them cutting off supplies and, and seeing the potential impacts to simply, you know, unconventional warfare, which, you know, continues. So today's strategic environment is very unique. So our two main competitors, let's first talk about Russia. So from a nuclear aspect, they are certainly our strategic peer and have been uh, certainly since uh, the 70s, uh, late 70s on. As you can see, they have a very substantial strategic force capability that, unlike the United States, is has been being modernized since the late 2000s and is about 86, 87 percent modernized. But what is excessively unique is their strategic what is considered non-strategic nuclear force structure. And I'll speak to that in the next slide. So in Russian viewpoints, 
So I think those who follow the, the conflict in Ukraine and what President Putin clearly states, he has been fairly active about toying with the, the nuclear aspects of his power. And that is very much dealing with what you see in the middle, the Iskander II, which is their short to medium range uh, missile that is capable of varying different um, sizes of, of nuclear warheads. And what is especially concerning was really their publishing of a, of an, of a revised doctrine in, uh, I think, about 16 or 17, about a concept called escalate to de-escalate. And it's the use of non-strategic level nuclear weapons, which such as the Iskander II, to be able to obtain that, that battlefield advantage, especially in terms of overcoming conventional superior or inferiority. Now, I will say this, this was NATO's posture uh, for a good chunk of the Cold War because unlike us at that time, the Soviets certainly had conventional superiority over that. And so in this case, what has changed is really a flipping of the script. Now, Russia has, as you can see, conventional inferiority, and they are threatening the use of this to, to, uh, to take advantage. So that's kind of the establishment of where Russia sits in this. China is what represents this new modern era of, of a strategic environment. They are... Historically, they had maintained what we would call minimum deterrence. I'll talk a little bit about that in, in here in a little bit. But the idea was, is we will maintain a sufficient force to re retaliate against you with nuclear weapons, but not one that is to the level that us in the Soviet Union have. And that is changed. And it has been what has been referred to as a strategic breakout. Now, although they certainly have a capable nuclear force, significant is the construction and rapid construction of a massive ICBM complex. The only reason to have ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, and in distance, think of that as 5,000, 5,500 kilometers or greater, is to be able to hold the United States and the continental United States at risk. There's no other reason for them. And so this has represented a tremendous sea change in terms of them wanting to become a strategic peer or a near strategic peer with both Russia and us. What's also been very concerning is they were the first country to successfully test what would be a nuclear capable hypersonic glide vehicle. And I will leave that to you to a, another time and what that represents, but it is a significant capability in terms of a nuclear global strike capability that they bring uh, that we are, Russia, are behind a bit. Now, for their viewpoints, it's all about Taiwan. And as you may have seen recently, uh, President Biden, I think it was last Sunday or Sunday before last, stated that, you know, somewhat clear and, un and unambiguous that we will be there to defend. Strategic ambiguity has always been uh, since 19, uh, 1979, the way that we have defended, I guess, uh, Taiwan at a time when China was not a military peer of any sort. Um, and that has rapidly changed. And as you can see in the lower half, uh, the Speaker of the House went to a visit and that caused a significant reaction, as you can see in the middle, about what they are going to do in terms of how they are going to defend or assume Taiwan. Now, from a military aspect, it when probably intelligence, it was a very insightful look at what their what we expected. Now most of this was already expected, but it gives you an idea of them tipping their hand about how rapidly they may be able to uh, present a force 
and uh, and be able to hold us at bay. And as the former National Security Advisor, H.R. McMaster, recently said in an interview, and I agree, it's probably the most dangerous flashpoint for war. And the former commander of United States Indo-Pacific Command, Emerald Davidson, had made clear on as he was leaving that he believed uh, a potential attack or the China being able to assume Taiwan would most likely take by 2027. And that the viewpoints of the current commander have not changed in that assessment. And what's to the right and why this is important, this is their class of short and medium range missiles. Um, CSIS, one of the think tanks, has probably the best um, in missile, but it's it's the tracking ballistic missiles among countries. So I certainly recommend their site, but it gives range. And if you look and what you can see over where China is, well, Japan is within the 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 early circle as the, the red one in, in, in the center, as is our island of Guam, which represents uh, our entire forward basing location. Hawaii sits obviously out, but what I want to illustrate is that they have the capability uh, conventionally and potentially nuclear to strike any site that we would potentially operate from. So they certainly represent a tremendous capability in in uh, in holding us or potentially holding us at risk. All right, so that oh, that's a good question. Is most dangerous flashpoint war still accurate in light of the last few days in Eastern Europe? I would say so. Uh, still, um, we are certainly there are certainly concerns about what Putin's end state may look like. Uh, those and like myself who was focused on um, Black Sea, Eurasia, Russian region um, will tell you that the pushback domestically hasn't been seen really since the Chechen Wars, where especially during the first Chechen one, Russian you know young men were coming back in body bags, and it caused the mothers of Russia to unite and really push back and cause change. So I think it's an interesting aspect about whether that could potentially cause a war. Um, but right now, I still, I, I tend to agree that this is the, the greatest concern, I think, for us in terms of a full-scale war. Great question. Next, uh, so let's talk about nuclear deterrence. What are we going to deter? So forgive, the, again, the lack of builds, but I want to start with the outgoing commander of United States Strategic Command. And I want to give everybody a few moments to read these two statements, which came out of his testimony uh, to the to the House or, or Senate Armed Services Committee, and both are very valid. So I'll give you a, a few minutes to read or a few seconds to read these. So the first I want to begin with is what I highlighted, every operational plan in DOD. So for those who've never been involved in military planning, operational plans are that which are tasked to the combatant commanders on, from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And those planning are based on, on the national military strategy, which is nested under the national defense strategy, and represent the greatest risk that we have in terms of preparing for conflict. There's different levels. That's another topic. But every single operational plan, which of course would represent those of China and Russia, are 
absolutely underscored by our ability to hold at risk through nuclear deterrence because both of them are nuclear powers. The second is what is of the greatest concerns in conflicts between nuclear powers, and that is the potential for escalation. And so if there is a use, then the counter use might cause another use and eventually begin to work itself up the escalation ladder, that's the term, to what could be potentially considered a full-scale strategic level nuclear war. And that would be bad. Um, but what has changed really is, especially in the post-9-11 world and, and post-Cold War world, was the idea that nuclear employment was not only not likely, but just was not possible to, it absolutely is now a real possibility. We have returned to this state, a state that had been, you know, certainly deemed, uh, you know, antiquated, but now is very much a real possibility. And the last statement is very clear, and I forgot to highlight it, but that you can't approach deterrence the way we did in, in the Cold War days, that it must be tailored and involved for a very different dynamic. And as I talk about nuclear deterrence, you'll see what a little bit more about what I mean. So deterrence is really three things. Deterring adversaries from using nuclear weapons, deterring adversaries from direct con um, conventional conflicts. And one could argue now that that nuclear deterrence has worked in Russia's favor by limiting uh, direct involvement from, from NATO members. And the third is communicating that whatever losses, uh, communicating that the losses you will have will far exceed any perceived gains. That would, some would deem that a, a Pyrrhic victory, um, another great term to look up for those who may not know that. So during the Cold War, there were really three giants, as you will, that helped establish the theories that were at least the, the foundational theories that were present during the Cold War and what evolved. The first, is, and you'll notice they all worked for RAND, which of course, during the Cold War, that was everything at that time. Um, Bernard Brody, I would argue, is the godfather, the grandfather of nuclear deterrence. His writings, which are available actually on Rand's website from the mid to late 50s, were the first attempts to begin thinking through this as the Soviet Union began to develop a concept of a nuclear force and, and a doctrine. And as they began to move in, establish the Warsaw Pact and begin to begin a serious threat. Herman Kahn. Um, is really the father, in a way, of mutual assured destruction. Mad, as you may recall, um, who is very much about the idea of having an overwhelming force. And then Thomas Schilling, who's unique because he was an economist, um, is really the father of minimum deterrence theory, of saying that we just need enough to say that, yeah, we can make you glow in the dark, but we're not going to have such an overwhelming force that um, is going to cause an arms race or this. But all three of these gentlemen were significantly important. And I listed three of their principal uh, books that they all each wrote. So for any of you that have an interest in, in reading, um, the first one, uh, for anything by Brody, he was he was really coming up with this from scratch. On thermonuclear war and thinking about the unthinkable really were uh, Herman Kahn's uh, tomes. And uh, for Schilling, actually, it was Arms and Influence, which became um, the one he's best known for, but certainly the ones prior to that. So these are the folks um, that for study and for understanding uh, are, are very uh, important to go. So I want to talk about nuclear deterrence, and I want to use formulas. Now, my, you know, I have a degree in social science and in, uh, international relations, and I'll explain why these formulas matter, but as a process guy, and especially one who is used to thinking qualitatively as a social science, I want to try to find where we can make the best assessments about where there may be failings. So as I walk through this, and the losing the builds kind of hurt, but work with me here, 
you'll kind of see about why this is a complex issue, especially when we talk about commitment. So nuclear deterrence is capability plus commitment should provide nuclear deterrence. But the common denominator is that they must actually be credible. And that is the issue that you have to determine. Are, does the United States and its allies have a credible nuclear deterrent? And that requires credibility for its parts. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So when we think about capability, it's kind of obvious. We're talking about three things. We're talking about nuclear warheads. We're talking about the delivery systems to provide those warheads. And we're talking about our entire nuclear command and control system, our ability to communicate to not only start the war, but hopefully it, in a survivable and assured way, be able to turn it off. So that's the capability. But how do we ensure it's credible? Well, I want to talk about who is responsible and how they go about that. So the nuclear enterprise, although there are many players out there, is a partnership between the Department of Energy and the Department of Defense. And so the National Nuclear Security Administration, they make the bombs. That is what their job is, to make them, to maintain them, um, and to be able to provide them to the Department of Defense, which we drop the bombs. It's that. So that is the division of labor, but it is a mutual effort and a mutual enterprise to be able to bring all of this together. Okay. So let's talk about, on the capability side, let's talk about the bomb side first. Now, building out this makes it easier, but it's to understand that there is a flow. And those who've worked within, especially the high levels of government, um, I, I will tell you it's all about what I call M&Ms, money and manpower. Because no matter what you do, you can have the best policy, the best strategy, and the best planning. And you can have all your requirements and resourcing needs identified. But at the end of the day, if it's not authorized and more importantly, appropriated by Congress, that is what really determines how credible of a capability we have. So when you look out at the discussions of, of the laboratories, they have not certainly received the modernization investments that they have. They talk about that publicly, nor especially for this side, the intellectual capital that they need to be able to do this. And they are having terrible retention problems, especially with the youngest generation of scientists and that who come in. And well, I'll simply say, if, if you're a young 28 year old with a PhD in applied physics, is making nuclear weapons your life calling as it was back in the early days. So they have some significant challenges to this. So our credibility really is about, are we able to have a stockpile of, of, of nuclear weapons that are viable and, uh, and be maintained? Now, the other part of capability is, can we show we can use it? So produce them and can you demonstrate them? Well, uh, 1991 was the last of, the, of, the, of our nuclear testing. We had over a thousand tests. Um, this is uh, Abel um, or Baker. Oh, I think I just lost that one. Um, this was a massive underwater explosion, very famous photo. You can go back and read about it. Uh, megaton, multi-megaton range. But part of the testing was to be able to actually show not only can we make nukes, but we can actually blow them up. So every test is a demonstration of our capability, which goes directly to credibility. All right. So how about on DOD side? A little more um, nuanced. I've put in the directives to kind of give you an idea of it, but we develop policy, national security strategy and PPDs which lead to DOD developing the strategies, which lead to the type of planning. I'd reference the National Military Strategy. This Joint Strategic Campaign Plan is actually the document that the chairman produces to tell exactly what the plan for, for operational planning combatant commanders. 
They go to the requirements. So during the planning process, the requirements about what it would take to be able to, to achieve a particular end effect and the capabilities are required for that, which go to the two services, the Air Force and the Navy, which represent the entirety of the triad. Uh, bombers and ICBMs for the Air Force, and of course, nuclear submarines and sub-launched uh, ballistic missiles for the Navy, who have to, you know, create POM, Program Objective Memoranda, which again, have to be authorized and more importantly, appropriated um, to be able to produce this. And as you've seen in terms of discussions about, uh, should we keep this type of system? Should we keep this type of, of cruise missile? All of that all goes to authorization appropriation. And that too goes to our credibility. So everything we do is fairly transparent to the world and you have to judge, including our own modernization efforts or sustainment of our existing legacy systems. Now for demonstration, well, it's obvious. Every time we do a test out of uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base of an ICBM, or they do a test of a sub launch cruise missile, those are picked up by our adversaries and well, practically everybody in the world. Yes, we can pull one and our um, process is we will literally pluck one from a hole and randomly and shove it in a silo out at our test sites and launch it. And we will show, or in a sub, and show that this thing is effective. So so it's certainly a credible deterrent in that aspect. But I will tell you that's the easy part-ish. The commitment side is where it gets very complex. And this is where the social scientists will look at this and go, yeah, I get it. So let's go. So the first thing I want to explain, and unfortunately you can't see uh, my little gif going, but we are to deter adversaries, but our commitment is if deterrence fails, as we used to say back in the Cold War days, we nuke them till they glow. There is absolutely zero doubt in the minds of our adversaries that we will do what we say we will do. That the training and the personnel involved will be able to perform the mission, that our entire nuclear command and control structure will ensure that those orders those things that have to be um, authentic and validated, which are two of the big words in that business, those orders are sent out and we will be able to launch. So it's very, very important to understand that in our community, we are training to use these if we ever have to. When deterrence holds and we're sitting there doing nothing, we are doing our jobs. If everything goes sideways, we are doing our jobs. So kind of a two for there. So when it comes to commitments, multiple formulas, and you'll see why as I go through, but these help identify where the credibility areas are and where there may be problems. So overall, commitment to me is national policy plus the way we communicate, plus communication plus our national resolve. And each one of those has their own little formula to kind of how we do that. And so I want to go through each one of these to kind of get an idea of what that means. So the first has to do with national policy. Well, some of you may have heard about declaratory policy. No first use. First use. Ambiguous. And those are produced, you know, in our strategies. And then they're obviously communicated out there. But that is one of those. How do we feel about nuclear weapons? The second is our threats. And of course, the intelligence community uh, produces annual threat assessments and other types of things, documents out there that really give us the type of intelligence and understanding to truly assess what we're facing. And the third is actually a constraint, and that is our treaties. And for those who may know or not, um, treaties in our constitution are equal to the supreme law of the land. Basically, when we sign up for a treaty and we ratify it, that's federal law. And so that puts a constraint on us in the type of national policy we do. And so that's an example of some of the current existing uh, treaties that we've either ratified or in a few cases, 
um, or in one case, like comprehensive test ban treaty, we implement certain of the protocols and we kind of follow as part of, of customary international law. All right, so that's the first one. All right, so that's one piece. Let's talk about communication. So we have strategic messaging and because we have divided branches of government, not only do we have what the presidential administration will say, but we also have what Congress says. So when they disagree with the president's view on a system or whatever, that's being messaged to the world. But we also have the way adversaries perceive what we say. And those like myself, and others who have a lot of international experience, not only working with international partners, but like me sitting across the table in a delegation uh, for the START Treaty uh, and during the Joint Compliance Inspection Commission with ours, there's no such thing as direct translation uh, because there's no such thing as a direct uh, translated meaning. And so each one of the perceptions of how they are seeing this is really the summation of the entire host of social sciences, of culture, history, language, politics, religion, economics, keep going down the social sciences. And you can see just by looking at the leaders of our four principal adversaries, nobody looks alike and, and certainly from cultures have any way to perceive the same meaning. So when Admiral Richard talked about unique ways, the Cold War provides us a certain level of lessons, but it was solely for the Soviets, a, a, a you know, a communist, um, Leninist, Stalinist viewpoint of a Slavic society. That was a singular focus in how we thought about deterrence. In today's world, especially with either the three nuclear powers or if Iran decides to cross that threshold, the way that we message must be the individuals that is probably our greatest challenge and credibility. All right, next. The last is national resolve. We have certainly unique political dynamics. So whatever that's happening and however that works, you see it is absolutely, well, we are a country of what we are. But our constraint is certainly the will of the people. And I used a Vietnam photo, but the fact is, is that, you know, right now we get a lot of public support for certain things. Will we have that if a nuclear tipping point happens? And at the end of the day, that is our society in this, but that is certainly a constraint in the resolve we would have. And that is also communicated to the world. So when we think about nuclear deterrence, I want you to understand these things, that great power competition is now back, but it's, it's more complex than it ever has been, that we have a strategic tripolar world that we are facing in a way that has never been before, that nuclear weapons use is a reality again, deterrence is essential, but credibility, which is absolutely necessary, is a complex issue that has so many facets to it that our ability to turn our, our adversaries, our very complex adversaries, is always and forever at risk, if not well maintained. And so I'll end this by saying a couple of things. Number one, um, I am at your service because first and foremost, I am a member of this community. It has been my entire professional life, as is everyone in it and those I know. Um, I do recommend those to uh, feel free to uh, uh, reach out and link in with me. I post a lot about nuclear deterrence matters. I comment in detail on quite a few things and, um, and have built kind of a base for that. But as one of the, the more senior uh, subject experts, I want to be able to communicate out there, you know, different things that are being said, whether they're correct or not or that. And then the other is web links to really what I would argue is the best way to kind of understand um, all the aspects and various parts of what I what I have just talked about. So with that, um, I'm up for for questions, and and I certainly appreciate those 
in the box. So, um, John, is this a good time to kind of go back through, or how would you like to do this? Yeah, I have uh, some that have been queued up in the um, in the Q and A, and then there's a couple more in the chat that I'll get to. So, what I'll do is I'll I'll, uh, I'll present them up, and uh, the first one you won't need to answer. It's actually for me, but then after that. Uh, I read them out loud so the people on the phone hear them, and then you, you can uh, go ahead and answer them. Sounds great. Um, but uh, so the first one is just asking if this presentation will be recorded, made available available in the next few days. Um, within about 48 hours normally, we'll have it recorded, and it'll go on the HDIAC YouTube channel. And then if you just want the slides, they are also on the HDIAC website, uh, hdiac.org slash webinars, and you can find today's webinar. And um, you can you can download the, um, the slides, and then that's there's a watch webinar button that once it's posted, um, that'll take you to the YouTube link, and all the registered users um, should get an email once once the uh, presentation is available on YouTube. So moving right along, this question comes from Pete Lyon. Uh, what are the differences between cruise and ballistic missiles, <laughs> and what are the specific uses for each type? Look at you, Pete. Bless your heart. Um, no, and and I think for the audience, this is very good. So ballistic missile, the easiest way to explain a ballistic missile is go out in your yard, grab a rock, and throw it. That is ballistics. There is no difference between what you just did and a ballistic missile. The power is up, and then once it hits the apogee, it's free falling, and a lot of mathematics will tell you exactly where it's going to land. And so that is a ballistic missile. A cruise missile is a missile that flies on its own, that especially today can does train following, can change course, can do all of that wonderful thing. So um, they certainly, well, I caveat this. Historically, they never had anywhere near the range of ICBMs. The new hypersonic cruise missile may change that entire dynamic. So as they have claimed it can circumvent the globe, yeah, that's a problem. So cruise missiles in terms of distance, yes, maybe now on par with ballistic missiles. Um, but that's the difference is a cruise missile can go on its own. Once it's launched, uh, whether from ground or, or dropped from an aircraft, it's, it does its own thing. Um, and the use is really between the two um, ballistic missiles. Um, actually, especially short range, medium range, uh, they're both excellent to use for varying reasons. And in fact, they're a mix of different capabilities. Um, ballistic missiles, once you know where they're going, and this is where missile defense systems, if you, you got a shot to shoot it down, whether as it's going up, once it hits its apogee or coming down, you've got an ability to, to take it out because like throwing a rock, it's only going to go in one direction and one pathway. Cruise missiles, a little bit harder. And so there is some um, capability difference between the ability to actually stop a cruise missile. And Tomahawk missiles are a great example of those. We can sling those in and multitudes. They're very hard to take out. So that would be my answer to that. And there are certainly others who can talk in detail, but in general, that's, I think, a good basics. So thanks, Pete. All right, great. Thank you. All right. The next one, and speaking of hypersonics, comes from uh, John Organek. Uh, how important on a scale of 1 to 10 are hypersonics to deterrence compared with the rest of the deterrence portfolio? Should hypersonics be included in the New START treaty negotiations with Russia? That is, both sides should agree to limitations on their use. Oh, well, that second question is a fun one. So the first one, hypersonics to the deterrence. Um, I don't think they're that big of a deal for nuclear. Conventional, they definitely offer up, especially for conventional global strike. Um, right now, if you want to hit a target in North Korea, for example, and be able to successfully do it, you basically have to launch a 40-hour mission in a B-2s out of, you know, Nob uh Missouri to hit them without, you know, being able to get in country and come back. That is not a useful, a really good strategic option for a conventional strike. This is where hypersonics 
can be a very valuable strategic strike tool uh, to allow the president to have more of a multitude of options and more importantly, time standards. Because if you want to strike something near and dear and they've got systems to prevent, you know, aircraft like the B-1 or B-52 or that, or even Tomahawks or anywhere getting a ship anywhere near, hypersonics will change that. But I think for the rest of, for nuclear deterrence, we'll see how the hypersonic missile and what we kind of get out of out of China's test. I think it's a little too early to tell, but right now it's not what we're more concerned about. Um, what I am concerned about is something like North Korea successfully testing an ICBM because right now they cannot hit the continent of the United States. But if they can field a successful ICBM a ballistic missile with a mated warhead, they have now changed the calculus of American losses in North Korea or in a Korean Peninsula war from maybe a few hundred thousand to being able to hold five million people at risk. Americans at risk. So that's where we still have a grave concern, uh, you know, in, in terms of nuclear deterrence. Now, hypersonics and start treaty negotiations with Russia or in China. I will tell you, having been, you know, exposed to all of those and seeing this firsthand, um, yes, it's going to be there. But the problem is they're going to want it for us too. And I think what's going to be an interesting fight is going to be actually an internal fight because I suspect the services will heavily non-concur with the idea of including telemetry exchanges and technology exchanges or, you know, or movements in that as part of a treaty because they don't want to give up what we have. So I think you're going to see an internal fight between the services, perhaps the intelligence community, um, and those that gain access or, you know, things from different t capabilities kind of pushing back about what we really want to collect or what we don't. So I think it's not just wanting to negotiate with our, with our adversaries, but it's also going to come to an interagency conclusion about what we deem is acceptable for us to give up. So that's an excellent question and one that is incredibly relevant. Great. Thank you very much. This one comes from uh, Scott Armistead. Uh, what is the thinking on development and use of overwhelming non-nuclear strategic capabilities as a leg of deterrence? For example, rods from God, massive hypersonic missile strikes, <laughs> or other, other able to inflict localized destruction similar to that of a nuke strike. Um, are such capability developments considered stabilizing or not? And similarly, how are new nuclear weapons post-launch intercept destruction capabilities looked at, i.e. space-based intercept? Well, I like the rods from gods at 53 and 30 years. I remember when that was talked about quite a bit. Um, so first, yes, I, I, we need to develop and continue with a substantial amount of conventional capabilities. Hence why I talked about a, a true, honest to God, conventional global strike capability, because that is not within a day and a half but is an option for attribution and in different varying ways. So I think that is absolutely crucial. And yes, not being able to use nukes would be a, a, a good thing. Nobody's, nobody, one thing that's interesting, we were the only nation to use nuclear weapons. We have been the only nation to choose not to use them. And what I mean by that was during, so Truman made the decision to, to drop the bombs in World War II, he also made the decision that we will not use nuclear weapons after the invasion of the, Chi of, of the Chinese um, during the Korean conflict. Even though I can tell you that for a fact that, you know, Curtis LeMay and the collective absolutely wanted to use them. So um, this decision to ever, you know, do it again is going to be a big one. The problem is to inflict localized destruction similar to that of a nuclear strike. To give you an idea of the power of a nuclear weapon, of the smallest one, the smallest nuclear weapon ever made called the Davy Crockett, which was the size of uh, um, uh, maybe about two or three feet long, has is, had as much destructive power as the largest conventional weapon we have today, the Moab. So in turn, and that's a little dinky one. 
fact is, is there's no comparison between what a, a the smallest nuclear yield can produce and the largest amount of conventional weapons. Um, so, and truthfully, there is no kinetic ability to even match the two without having an unbelievable amount of of conventional strikes in multi platforms, whether they're ballistic, whether they're cruise missiles, whether they're you know aircraft based. The fact is, it would take a tremendous effort to even come close. Um, I would argue that this is where other aspects, such as um, the cyber domain becomes important into looking at multitudes of potential effects to achieve that common answer. So instead of destroying everything, what are our objectives? What are we trying to achieve to an adversary? And let the military and the combatant commanders all come to a conclusion about what are the best courses of action to present the SECDEF and uh, president to be able to achieve whatever effect we're going to do. Um, stabilizing or not, that remains to be seen on the hypersonic side. Um, I, tend, I tend to fall in the camp that missile defense systems tend to be somewhat destabilizing because unlike offensive weapons, which you can literally count, I've got 400 ICBMs with single warheads. I've got this many subs. I know this many launchers. Missile defense systems are number one, not transparent in terms of their capabilities. We don't want to do that. But number two, we don't know if they're going to work or not. We think they will, and they think they will, but they're going to assume they're all going to work, and then they're going to make it even worse. So if I know you've got 100 interceptors, I have to build more. I'm just going to assume they all work. So I think it's somewhat destabilizing. I'm not arguing against it, but what I'm saying is you cannot, there's, there's no objective criteria to look at a missile defense system other than assuming it's all going to work and respond in kind. And then when we talk about space-based stuff, so the Outer Space Treaty signed in 67 prohibits nuclear weapons in space, among other things. Um, that's good. That was always considered global common. We wanted it to maintain that. Um, but if our adversaries decide to put in space-based terrestrial focused weapon systems, I, we're going to have to respond in kind, I'm sure. Um, so I will say, and I will leave that to those. Certainly I did my space time, but I was a satellite. I was a SATCOM person. But those that are involved in that and those discussions would make for an excellent uh, next presentation, John. <laughs> Very good. Next Very question. good. We are uh, a little over time, but if you still have time, I'd like to keep going through the questions. Let's keep really going. Good. I have okay. all the time for so for the if, collective. If you ask the question and you have to drop off, you know, we, we are recording this, so so uh, it will be answered um, and and it will be on the YouTube presentation. So let's move on to the next one from uh, Al Brzezinski. Uh, in the summer of 1961, President Kennedy asked Congress for $207 million to plan and create shelters to protect Americans from a nuclear attack. And in Octo on October 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis seemed to make an imminent attack a possibility. Taking into consideration the current situation, do you know if a new civil defense emergency hospital package disaster hospital exists today? If not, is this something that is being discussed? So it's actually a very good question. Um, it's interesting. So in 1983, November of 1983, they aired the, the television film The Day After. I was 14 years old, sitting with my mom watching that, and it scared the bejesus out of me. And for those who've never watched it, it's a historic film. Uh, President Reagan actually pre-screened it, and his diary, he wrote, I think it left him, I don't remember the word, not disturbed or or bummed, but I mean, it really bothered him and it really set the course in many ways for him to really pursue what ultimately became the meeting with uh, Gorbachev in in, uh, in Keflavik, Iceland in 86. Um, the reason I bring that up is because the truth is there's absolutely no civil defense measures that would matter in a massive retaliation. Um, and in fact, by that point, and the reason I brought that up is because my mom, who happened to be born in 1932, remembered the Cuban Missile Crisis personally. 
I mean, and as an adult, and we talked about that and the old days of hiding under your table and everything. Fact was, that was a feel good measure more than anything. Um, the advent of highly accurate, multiple independent retarding uh, ICBMs where they would have 10 or 12 warheads, they were fairly accurate. It kind of ended the ability to kind of overly protect yourself. Not that you couldn't dig deep, but there's reasons why, you know, bedrock and things like that are what we bury underneath because at the end of the day, these are going to form craters that are not going to matter. Now, you might survive an attack, say, here in D.C., obviously Andrews Air Force Base, where Air Force One and, and, and that would be certainly a target in the Pentagon area. And, yes, you might be able to survive the heat and the explosion, but the radiation would be absolutely tremendous. So in terms of being able to do civil defense things, um, believe it or not, they're all well understood. I don't know. It, this would definitely fall under the Department of Homeland Security, FEMA would certainly probably be most likely be the lead federal agency, I suspect. Um, I would say anything that's understood about radiation and the effects of it is all long known. So from, you know, having iodine tablets to protect your, your, what is it, your thorax, one of those to, uh, um, to, you know, water and, and rebreathe, all of that stuff exists for those who would be concerned. Uh, but I don't, I'm not aware of anything uh, today. But as I told uh, my Gen Z aged uh, uh, daughter and, and her boyfriend when she asked about or he asked about, you know, would we be safe where we live in Southern Maryland? I'm like, I would suggest going out on the on the roof, holding hands and, and waiting for the for the show, because, no, <laughs> you might as well be in the middle of it. So but appreciate the question. That's actually a very good question on, on minds of people. Well, um, pardon any uh, disruption here as I move to my basement. Um, but uh, next question comes from Donald Ponikvar. Uh, you mentioned modernization and sustainment. How important is nuclear weapon effects testing and nuclear survivability assessment in creating or maintaining credible deterrence? Well, so the first is interesting because, well, well, this sounds like an Army 52 talking. Um, so, first of all, modernization and sustainment, two really major differences. We are maintaining, we have had to maintain and constantly maintain uh, our current nuclear structure. So, sustainment is incredible. And the folks that are active in maintaining systems that, well, the B 52 will eventually be a 100 year old aircraft after they re engine it and re cockpit and do everything else. Um, how important is nuclear weapon effects? testing um well nuclear weapons testing we have there's a reason we never we never ratified the comprehensive test ban treaty we've always left that open we use computer modeling and that um with with certainly weapons itself weapons effects testing now i again i will lead this to that 52 community and those who've done it i am not sure there is any new thing left to understand the effects piece of this, unless we change the type of weapon uh, in terms of either, you know, the amount of neutrons it, it produces or things going back to electromagnetic pulse or some of that aspects of it, um, I, I, I would lend that to them, uh, to someone of that expertise. Uh, but myself, I am aware of nothing that it would be new under the sun because we did so much of it. Um, in terms of nuclear survivability assessments, I think that's absolutely huge for a couple of reasons. Number one was hemp hardening or being able to harden against EMP events. During the Cold War, um, all the defense programs had that built into requirements. They were designed because everything was, oh, we might go to a nuclear war. So we have to be able to harden communication systems, everything else. That disappeared following the end of the Cold War. And I remember when that raised its head after, really came after the release of a book, a fiction book called uh, One Second After, which thanks to Newt Gingrich ended up getting all over, 
you know, Congress and the Pentagon and everything else. It's a very good read. It's very entertaining. But it was the idea that EMP events could be problematic, especially if you can launch a high altitude uh, weapon. And someone like Iran, which already has a space lift capability, which is a medium range booster, is, is enough that if they could put a warhead on that of any sort, they could launch it to 100,000 feet and blow it up and would have potential effects in, uh, in today's you know, electronic circuitry and the things that we have today. And I know that there is definitely an interest in heavily exploring the effects of neutrons and that on, on microprocessors and everything we have, which simply did not exist during the days of, of most of our above ground testing. I will say in the movie The Day After from 1983, as soon they they actually illustrate a high altitude burst and a whole bunch of cars, which by this point had electronic um, um, electronics in it versus uh, they were simplistic, but all the all the cars stopped working. <laughs> and so this has been thought about certainly for a long time. So I think the survivability assessments of what is our adversary threats today is absolutely critical. And not only to our, and it is part of our deterrent to show that we can take a strike and be able to continue to operate. Absolutely. Now, that's a great question. Great. Great. Thank you. And next question from uh, Ed Moaz. Does Russia's failure in Ukraine conventional war imply anything about their nuclear capabilities? Um, I. I would say generally no. And the reason is, is it's generally known among us who, you know, spend our time looking at them, that the, that the Russian strategic rocket forces were the most professionalized of their entire military structure. They're somewhat independent. Um, they have always been interested in professionalization of their NCO core, things that are not normal for, you know, really, you know, central to Eastern European uh, militaries. Um, they were exposed to us in 1990, you know, beginning in 94 with the, uh, with the START Treaty entering into force. In fact, I was up there when they came. I was up at Malmstrom Air Force Base, Great Falls, Montana, when they, when the first inspection came and was there. And so we've had you know, because of the treaties and the on-site inspection regimes and that, you know, there's been a great understanding of how we do things. And they have tried to maintain a much more professionalized force. Um, and there's always been a push to maintain modernization of their systems, whether it is from the Bolova sub-launch ballistic missile, which had a lot of problems up front, but works very well now, which came out when I was a treaty inspector. Uh, during 2007 to, um, or 2006, I think, to upgrading their mobile ICBMs, uh, the SS now 27, and they even have a mod version of that now. Uh, so they have maintained a very significant force. So I would, I would say, generally speaking, don't take any lessons from their conventional capabilities to say how well would they be able to execute nuclear operations i think they would probably do it just dandy so but great question yep okay and moving on to the what is the last question for, for now at least uh from greg should we focus on small form factor nuclear devices as significant threats in the near term like five to ten years uavs at possible delivery vehicles so uh, when we saw form factor devices, if we're talking about the warheads themselves, absolutely. Um, Russia has a tremendous, we, this is when this whole issue of having low yield responses came back because we had gotten rid of all of ours. So the problem was if they use a, you know, three kiloton weapon or one kiloton or something in theater, we have no real response. We're not going to unleash a 300 kiloton weapon in response. And the fact is, is low yield makes perfect sense to Russia and to China, especially in terms of China, you know, being able to launch those in the ocean, you know, 30 miles off the coast of Taiwan to tell us to stay away kind of thing. Um, I think that's absolutely the case. And China, especially 
with the successful test of their hypersonic uh, launch vehicle, that that absolutely does represent a tremendous threat uh, in the near term. And even before then, I would say one to 10. So no, absolutely. And thankfully, that is a good focus of what we're we're looking at from their capability aspects. So absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, that is the end of the, uh, the questions that I have right now. Uh, so again, Robert, thank you so much for the presentation. It was outstanding. Uh, I had a lot of time. Actually, sorry, there's one more question just popped in. Oh, please. Um, from Luke Tyree. Uh, do you think the U.S. would respond and how to a non-strategic nuclear weapon used by Russia in Ukraine? It's a good question. And it's the most applicable. Well, I would argue, I mean, ultimately, the release authority, the authority to use nuclear weapons is with the president. He's not, he doesn't tell us that we have to use them. We have laws of, of war and all laws of armed conflict to, to dictate proportionality and, and the many things that have to go through. But what I would say is this. Right now, the president would be, present, would be presented a true slew of options by the commander of U.S. European Command, which that's who would be the supported commander for that Aaron, who's the one highly engaged, who also happens to be dual-hatted as the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, the Secretary of NATO, um, and that has been since its formation with President Eisenhower. Um, I suspect that if it is a very low yield, even if it is used in a in 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 Ukraine, I would suspect we have the capabilities to respond conventionally or through our gray zone capabilities that could have a significantly brutal impact that Russia may not even begin to anticipate from all matters of the instruments of national power, whether it's diplomatic information, intelligence, law enforcement, economic finance. I mean, we can come to bear and the global community I suspect, including China, India, Pakistan, none of them want to see a nuke used. And because nobody has cut that cake. And once it opens up, there's a fear that that becomes an acceptable response. And how people and how these nations react are going to be a clear indicator. So I suspect that unless it affects a NATO member, most likely Poland, because they are a border nation, or there is a potential impact or invasion, unless there's an outright invasion into the Baltics or something to that effect, I don't think we would necessarily respond. But that option is absolutely available, if as long as the president authorizes the release of the weapons. So that's probably the best answer I can give you. And I will tell you, as uh, General Anthony Cotton is going to be confirmed, or has been, not sure yet, as the new Commander of Strategic Command. Um, between that, Chairman Milley the sec and Secretary Austin and the Commander of UCOM uh, and SAC, all of them will be in that conversation. And I suspect any use of a nuclear weapon, certainly by our main allies, the UK, France, Germany, you know, those would probably maybe in that decision calculus. So I think using a nuclear weapon would require a little more effort possibly. But um, I think conventionally and through many other means, we would probably consider that option before we would ever use one. But again, that's my sole opinion. So. All right. Well, terrific. Thank you so much again. Uh, I think that will finally finally end it, um, but but terrific presentation, great Q and A at, at the end. And again, this is going to be posted on our YouTube channel for anybody to go back and view. Presentation slides are available for download on our website. Uh, thank you to all the attendees. We had many attendees up for this uh, presentation, so really appreciate it. If you need any other, um, have any questions for uh, Robert Hill, he had put his. Um, 
it, it, it's contact information up there, but you can also reach out to contact at hdiac.org and get in touch with them. And again, Robert, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you all. And, I, and thank you all for the great questions. I appreciate it.